everyone. It's Matt Fraser here with Digital Web Solutions with this episode of eCoffee with Experts. My name's Matt Fraser. On the show today, I have with me Travis Bliffin. Travis is the founder of Stellar SEO, an award-winning link building agency located in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Stellar SEO specializes in building custom content marketing and link building campaigns for growth-minded companies and delivers end-to-end SEO solutions for law firms. When not running his agency, Travis can be found spending time with his family, doing sport shooting and leisure karting in the outdoors, and attending car shows. Travis, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Great to have you here. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Hey, fantastic. So, Travis, uh, you've had an interesting journey so far. Uh, Who was Travis as a school kid? Yeah, so it's pretty funny. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say that if I went back in time, I could foreshadow where I would be today in terms of profession. Um, pretty, pretty shy, quiet kid in, in grade school. Uh, no real interest in business, technology, computers. Um, you know, I played video games, did the normal stuff you would do in the in the 90s. Um, mm-hmm. But but nothing too overly exciting or, or nothing that really pointed to a uh, future in digital marketing. That's for sure. Wow. What was your favorite subject? Um, well, I didn't have a lot of favorite subjects, but I'd say probably yeah. English would be uh, one of the better ones. Math is, has always been a pain for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think somewhere about sixth grade, honestly, I missed something. And then the rest of the time for it after that, uh, I was trying to figure out what it is I missed along the way to uh, oh. fill that back in. But you know, I, I guess I made it out okay, but it was an yeah. interesting journey. Okay, right on. So in 2012, you you founded Stellar SEO. How, how did that happen? Yeah, so it was kind of a, a chance happenstance that, that took place there. Um, wow. So I graduated high school. I joined the Army. We got mm-hmm. out of the Army after about four and a half years. Uh, got a job for the Department of Corrections, okay. uh, Illinois Department of Corrections. So I worked there. And so after a little while, and it was a a pretty easy job, but after a little while, um, they closed some other facilities. And so the people from those facilities came to ours. Uh, Mm -hmm. Being one of the newer people there, I actually got bumped to midnight shift. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that was not for me. It it was horrible. I felt like a Mm -hmm. zombie all the time. Mm -hmm. So one day on the way into work, I stop, I pick up a magazine. The magazine has a list of, you know, X number of best businesses to start in 2012 or 2011, whichever the year was. Um, And SEO was actually on that list. So I really had not heard of it or been aware of it prior to that point. Um, I did take a little bit of web design classes because I was curious in that. So it it kind of made sense initially, but that's where I got the idea at to start uh, getting into SEO. And and that's how things began is I, I pulled it off of the list and went for it. Well, that's pretty amazing. Um, how did you get, so how did you learn about SEO then? Like the whole practice of doing it? Yeah. So very much was self-taught going back to that, uh, love of English. I actually got into SEO first by writing blog posts for people. And it was on Upwork back when it was Elance. Oh so yeah. The very first thing there is I actually would write blog posts for a website uh, first client I ever had was a tanning salon. They had a couple locations like St. Petersburg, Pinellas Park, Florida. Uh-huh. And so they hired me to write blog posts. So I was writing blog posts for them. And after a while of doing that, I basically asked them, you know, what, what are you guys trying to do with these? Of course, they were trying to rank better. Was their yeah. ultimate goal for these blog, blog posts? And so they actually hired me to do SEO for their website. And mm-hmm. so in that time in between, when I first found out about it and when they hired me from a blog writer to be an SEO person, uh, I basically just sat, set up uh, test websites. And oh, yeah. I was, I was kind of self-learning the, the entire time by testing out different stuff to see what would work and, and what didn't work. Um, obviously, went through some courses and things early on as well mm-hmm. to kind of get a sense of it. Um, but big thing was I, I just found a lot of information, tested it out to see if I could make anything work. And then what did work out, I took that and I applied it. Um, and, and that's how I kind of got going with it. Well, that's pretty amazing. So these test sites, what did they look like? For instance, were they just made up words that you were testing? 
Yeah. So at that time you could still get stuff to rank. You could use, so GSA search engine ranker, um, you could set up web 2.0 blogs and get those to rank for stuff. Okay. Um, so those are some of the early tests, like basically blogs, I would try to get them to rank for different informational searches. Oh, okay. Um, and then from there, it actually evolved into, uh, I set up some test websites early on and it would be something like St. Louis SEO agency, something like that. Uh-huh. Uh, and then I used, I actually published an article on website magazine several years ago. I set up a test website and I used GSA search engine ranker and a uh-huh. tiered link building. Yeah. And I actually rank that in St. Louis for St. Louis SEO, uh, some other keywords like that. So yeah. it started with really simple searches and then it kind of evolved to see how much I could push it. Um, I think it was about the same time Gotch SEO was, was promoting their SEO services in St. Louis uh-huh. before they got into training and stuff. And so um, there's kind of some back and forth between his site ranking and mine, but I published a cool article on it. Um, and, and basically that was already at the time where people said that it wouldn't work any longer. And yeah. so we've kind of stuck with, with that. We haven't stuck with GSA search and ranker, but we've stuck to testing the entire time since we started. Uh, and the reason why is because way early on, we figured out that what people tell you does or does not work is definitely not the same as what actually will or will not work. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of that's, how we have from. That's amazing. So you, so basically your experience in doing testing really proved um, the proof in the pudding was the testing in regards to, knowing what was going to work and what doesn't work. Yeah. And and that's the other thing is you probably know in 2012, one of the biggest Google updates ever came out 2011, 2012 timeline. Um, yeah. So when we first started as an agency, a lot of the phone calls we got from clients were people who had been penalized from whatever they'd been doing up until that point and they yeah. needed recovery. And so that was the other part that where the testing really helped out is we had to take and and go down a very custom route to figure out what the problems were because there wasn't like a ready-made turnkey solution to fix them at that time. Um, And so those kind of things really worked hand in hand. And that's what kind of started to shape how we would operate as an agency for years to come is, is kind of what we went through in the initial learning. And then as soon as we decided to, to take it and make it a business, the timing of that was, was, uh, wasn't the best time to be an SEO agency, I wouldn't say, but uh, we figured out a good way to help people solve their problems. And so it actually turned out to be a great time to get started. So that was the the Google Penguin update that you were referring to, right? In 2012? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely, that was a huge update. That's for sure. Uh, how, how do you think that changed the game in regards to SEO and how SEO was done? Yeah, I mean, it, one of the biggest things that came out of that is is switching the entire approach to anchor text, to link building, to making things look natural. Yeah. Because yeah. you have to remember prior to that time, if you wanted to rank for red shoes, you would get as many places to link to you as you possibly could saying red shoes. And yeah. on your website, you would just keyword stuff, yeah. excessively yeah. red shoes and all different variations of that. And so that was really when it started to take the first big turn from, um, you know, just blatantly spammy repetition of certain things. And then you had to start being more strategic. So I think it was really a maturing point. One of the early maturing points for the SEO industry. Um, How do you think it's changed between before Penguin and after Penguin? Like what, what are some of the things that you approach differently or that you helped clients, what are some of the things that you helped clients change that they were coming to you for, for SEO at, at that time after Penguin was released? So one of the first things that we did is we kind of scrapped best practices. Because okay. if you remember up until then, best practices were you use these keywords as much as you can, and yeah. that's how you're going to rank the site, right? Yeah. And that was the standard best practice across the industry. And that blew up when the update came out. Yeah. So at that point, that's one of the first things we said is, all right, let's scrap whatever we think we know about best practices and let's look at it on a case by case basis. What's ranking okay. right now in your industry and what is it that they've done differently than you? Yeah. And yeah. what can we do to replicate that? And yeah. so, you know, as far as diversifying anchor text, as far as on page optimization, 
Uh All of those things kind of changed. And that's something we still do today is we don't really follow many general practices. Uh, We instead just look at any particular search result and figure out exactly what's working. And of course we then, you know, check that against what we know to be a good practice or not, but the real answers are generally in what's already ranking. And so it started then, and it's something that's continued through now, um, you know, and, and even people with the most recent update in December that were having issues within a few weeks, we figured out how to help them reverse those and regain traffic that they lost and, and get things back up. Very same process. We started looking at what happened, what changed in the December yeah. update. We figured out pretty quickly, all of a sudden these five, six, 7,000 word guides that a lot of people had dropped to page two and they were replaced by articles that were half the length. Um, okay. Yeah. And in a lot of searches. And so that's something that we picked up on really quickly. Shorter content. Fast forward a month later and Google said, we're trying to figure out a way to to surface more concise answers to content. So that's something that we started then. We still do it now and it works just as well. Um, We always say we're a very process driven company. So Uh we take particular processes and we apply those to everything. Link building, anchor text selection, on-page SEO, troubleshooting, If you take the same process, you apply it with different inputs, you're going to figure out a different answer, but it's repeatable. So that's, that's how we approach things now. And, and that started way back then because of those changes. Wow. That's pretty amazing. So you're saying that the change that just came out this last December, like a couple, uh, it's March now. So three months ago or whichever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right on. Um, That's pretty interesting. So how would you explain SEO to a beginner? Yeah, so we went through all kinds of variations of that and we finally settled on, you know, it's really just a form of marketing in which you're showing up for people who are searching for what you offer. Yeah. Um, and obviously the, the benefit of that is if they're searching for it actively, the likelihood of them buying it from you goes up exponentially over outbound or other yeah. types of marketing where you don't necessarily know. And so SEO is really just a combination of things that we do to make sure that they have a much better chance of finding you when they are searching for something. And that's, yeah. you know, I mean, that's, that's what it, and it, at its most basic SEO is just another marketing channel. And there's, you know, a hundred different ways you can market a business. This just happens to be the one that we chose. And it yeah. turns out that it works pretty darn well. No, absolutely. And uh, absolutely. So you mentioned some tools uh, like GSA, I'm not sure the the GSA uh, search engine ranker. Uh, are there other tools that you regularly use for on-page SEO? Yeah, so so GSA is kind of there might be people still using it, but but we stopped using yeah. it probably you know five six years ago something like yeah. that. Um, <clears throat> but some tools that we really like now, Ahrefs by far Ahrefs, the favorite. Yeah. We used to yeah. be a huge fan of SEM Rush. Um, uh-huh. And so after a few years, though, they really seem like they started rolling out so many features that the yeah. quality of those new features kind of dropped off. And so oh, we okay. switched over to Ahrefs at that point. Uh, link research tools. It's an excellent tool if you're going to do link penalty recoveries, things like that. Um, oh, yeah. And for on-page SEO, Surfer SEO, uh, we tested a ton of different tools, Page Optimizer Pro, Cora, uh-huh. a bunch of tools. Surfer SEO is the one we settled on for on-page it's got a great balance of efficiency and user friendliness, um, but it gives you good information as well, as long as you make the right inputs. Um, so that, that's a great tool that we use as well. And Google, Google Drive, Sheets, Docs, all those things, because with scripts, yeah. you, can make, you can make automation um, and that can help you sort and share and, and do a lot with data manipulation that saves a ton of time. Oh, wow. Are those things you've developed in-house? Yeah, so we have, and and we went through <clears throat> several years ago, we went through the blueprint training from uh, Ryan Stewart Webers. And okay. so we're still a member of that training and they developed some tools and things as well that you can use if you're a member of that blueprint training. Um, but basically way back then, they built kind of the first version of a link building spreadsheet. Oh, so yeah. we actually took that, we pulled it in-house, we added a lot of additional stuff to it. Uh-huh. And so that's that's what we built as the framework for our link building service. And we still do everything with Google Sheets for a lot of that data because 
uh, through the scripts and automation, you can essentially move the information around and assign it to a different person based on a status, right? So if you market as live, for example, it can go from your sheet to a client report. If you market as revision needed, it can auto-populate in a writer's tab. There's a lot of really cool stuff you could do with... with oh, wow. Sheet. And you learned some of that stuff from the, loop, the Blueprint training. Uh, yeah, so we got the general concept from that. Uh, and then we actually used a web developer... Um, who was a PHP specialist. And, and he more or less said that the scripts in Google Sheets is a simplified version of PHP. Okay. And so he was able to build for us a lot of really cool stuff and automations. Oh, wow. um, and, and we've been using those for a long time now. That's if you have amazing. to stay on top of it because you'll break. Google Sheets tend to break if you get too much data in them. Okay. Um, but, you know, as long as you, you know, like you don't want to scrape a, 500,000 page e-commerce website into a Google sheet, it'll probably break. Um, okay. But if you use it and you segment the data into different things, it works great. All right on. So instead of using a project management tool like ClickUp or something like Asana, you're using the Google sheets to handle those SEO processes? Yeah. And it, and it works out extremely well because it, it's real-time collaboration um, whereas with some of the other programs, you, you have to first set it up, which we already had it set up. Um, and then sometimes you have to manually move things around or as you change yeah. status or whatever. But in this case, depending on what status we might assign to a particular line, it's going to go oh. where we need it to go. Wow. And so it, it saves so much time and it increases efficiency of what we do. And it cuts down a lot of back and forth. I mean, you imagine it's a link building company. We have, to, we have a ton of writers. Absolutely. And so you could spend a, a hours, you could have multiple full-time jobs just communicating and sharing documents back and forth with writers. Absolutely. But in this case, using Google Sheets, there's, it really cuts it down to be a very fast process. And so we spend a lot of our time collectively as a company on the things that really drive results versus spending them on things like project management and stuff like that, because it's just very streamlined. Um, that's pretty that's amazing. something that we've been doing a long time. Wow. So besides Ahrefs and Surfer SEO for on-page and, and are there any other like off-page tools that you regularly use for off-page uh, SEO? Yeah. So we keep it kind of simple. Our, our total uh -huh. toolbox that we use, uh, we use hunter.io for email, uh -huh. uh, Pitchbox, that's our preferred link outreach software, link research tools, Ahrefs, Surfer SEO, Google Sheets. Um, we have a CRM. Um, and a couple other things, but as far as SEO specific software, there's really only a handful of things that we use for those. Uh, uh -huh. Of course, Screaming Frog for crawling websites, stuff like oh, that. Oh yeah, uh, you know that's that's almost a given that that you'll have that in your toolbox. But um, you know that that's really what we use. Agency analytics on the reporting side. Oh okay, uh, it's a great tool. You can pull everything into it. You can customize the reports. Um, yeah we're very big on trying to simplify stuff for our clients as well. Um, mm. Sometimes you can make reports and you can generate reports and they have so much stuff in there. Yeah. It's really difficult to figure out if there's any value in any of it, especially as the client you're looking at and you're like, I, yeah. are things going good or bad? I really have no clue. And so exactly. we try to go the opposite of that and just simplify it so that, you know, let's focus on what really matters and let's talk about that and let's just not be distracted by all of the other, uh, you know, kind of shiny objects that, that do or, or, or don't really amount to anything of value. Yeah, absolutely. Was it a game changer using something like Ancientcy Analytics to communicate the value of what you're doing to the clients? Like, was it like, was it like, wow, why didn't we start using this first or a long time ago? So I don't know if it was a game changer because prior to okay. that, you could get similar information with uh, dashboards and Google analytics. Okay. Right. But the setup of that was a little more time intensive and yeah. the user friendliness was good, but there still was a level of confusion that could be there. Whereas agency analytics, it's super simple to set up. You can integrate yeah. it with a ton of outside data sources. So you do get a very holistic view of everything. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I think that does help people. And of course it's real time. So once we set a client up, we can give them login information. And so they're able to log into the dashboard, check rankings, check stats, look at any information they want to mm -hmm. in the dashboard. And so for some of our clients, 
they're using it to look at other data as well. Besides just what we're doing, they also have their email marketing, paid ads, social media, they have everything mm-hmm. integrated so they can log in and check it in real time. And so, um, you know, for them, I think it, it probably is a, a great convenience and time saver over what they've done before. But, you know, for our part of it, you can do it either way, but it is much more user friendly. Yeah. Um, and, and it's been a great program overall. Oh, that's awesome. So, uh, what are some of the common, Travis, common uh, SEO mistakes you've seen people make or other agencies make that you've had to fix? Uh, you could have like a, a 12 part series on, on SEO. <laughs> Maybe the top three. Yeah. So I, I think the biggest mistake that we see in general is people will just blindly follow a, a practice. Uh-huh. You know, somebody says you should have mostly branded anchor text. And so that's kind of open to interpretation and what people do with it. I've seen it really go on both ends of the spectrum. And sometimes it just doesn't work at all. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is if you looked at the industry, there are certain industries where you have to use a higher amount of, of exact match or partial match anchor text than you would for any other industry. So if you go to an industry like that, you start building a bunch of branded anchors not really going to get anywhere and you won't understand Uh why, because if you're looking at best practices, you're going to say, I'm doing what I'm supposed to, why isn't this working? And then you look at all the top 10 sites and you say, okay, I see. So that's probably mistake. Number one is just following a general practice. Um, Number two, I think is, is unrealistic expectations. And, And that comes on both sides. Sometimes it's the, the client side. Sometimes it's the agency side. But we found that most projects that, that fell or were a terrible uh, or terribly unsuccessful, uh-huh. it's an it's a issue where they were doomed from the start. So if somebody contacts yeah. you from an industry and you know this industry, you need to be investing $25,000 a month in SEO minimum to compete yeah. with everybody else. And yeah. then you go and you sell them a gold plan and it's $2,500 per month. Of course, they're going to be work that well, no. yeah. because you're not competing. SEO is very much a production game, producing yeah. links, producing content, producing momentum. And if you're not yeah. doing that at the right level, then you're not going to have success. And so I'd say that's mistake number two is unrealistic expectations are planned from the start. Number three, that's... a big one mm-hmm. um, is missing issues that are going to hold you back. So penalties, pre-existing problems, technical issues. Basically you start a campaign and you've, you've left something unchecked or unfixed and it's going to everything you do from working. Uh, Wow. We've had so many cases where we've had people come to us and, and come to find out all the new stuff they paid for was all good work that the company did, but there was a huge glaring issue that they missed. And so they really weren't seeing any benefit from what they did. And so uh, I'd say that that rounds out the top three is is uh, yeah. not making sure you're on a good starting ground before you start doing new stuff. And so that was may have probably been to a lack of experience and expertise from that other company that was doing all that work. They were probably just following. I can only speculate they are following a boilerplate SEO work instead of you know digging into the details for that particular client. Yeah, that's a hundred percent what it is. Uh, yeah, we've seen enough of it to to know that there's generally, as you see, extremely large SEO agencies. The likelihood of that becoming problematic goes up in a lot of cases because oh, yeah. you'll have senior management. They'll produce basically a boilerplate template, uh-huh. and then they'll hire a bunch of extremely junior level people who don't really have any SEO experience, and they just teach them how to follow the steps. So the yeah. people follow the steps, but they don't even know why they're following them. So they don't really, they can't troubleshoot. They can't figure out what it is. They just know they follow the steps. And so if it works 80% of the time, agencies that have that model are happy with it, right? Yeah. Because they're focused on scaling, they're focused on sales and new client intake. And so they follow that process. We're very focused on client retention, right? Yeah. So we want to retain clients way more than we want to bring on new clients. Okay. And so like each year that we've been in business, the amount of clients that we have from previous years goes up and up and up. And so the amount of new clients that we need to take on goes down. 
yeah. because people stick around for a long time. And so it's two different models, but that's, yeah. that is um, a big one. And, and we've been specifically hired to go and clean up those kind of issues where people are using very big companies that specialize in different industries and you uh-huh. know, they were unable to solve the problem because there's no wow. trouble. That's amazing. So how do you take the approach then to doing keyword research? Yep. So with keyword research, I think there's a couple of things that are really important. Everybody talks about keyword difficulty and search volume. Those are like, uh-huh. two that, and, and every training tells you, look at those, but yes. here's what I think actually matters. Okay. It's intent, both the intent search intent, right? Okay. Like what's going to show up, but also yeah. what's the intent of the person who's searching that and how okay. does it match to what you're doing? Uh-huh. Uh, value. What is the value overall of what you're offering? Because if you have a low volume, high difficulty keyword, yeah, but yeah. it has a tremendous value whenever there's a transaction, yeah, then that's a great keyword to target. People don't For target sure. sometimes because they don't know how to, or they're afraid to, or they don't have the ability to rank for those. So yeah. we kind of look at it from the opposite. We're not trying to find high volume, low difficulty, but less likely to convert keywords. What we're looking for are the keywords that make money, big money, because yeah. if they do on the other side of that, when you go back to pairing your investment with your goals and, and having the right plan, you can pick a keyword that's extremely difficult and has a tremendous value. And as long uh-huh. as you go into it, knowing that you have to invest X amount, then you can be successful. We've, we've helped websites rank for keywords like mesothelioma. Yeah. Right? That's a pretty big keyword. And it, it wasn't a small feat to do that. We've ranked a lot of stuff in the personal injury space, big keywords, huge cost per clicks. Uh-huh. Um, and it's, it's not a matter of, you know, can you rank for a keyword or not? It's of course you can, as long as you invest what you need to in order yeah. to do it. And the decision to do that has to be dependent upon what's the actual value of ranking for this keyword. And so when we look at keyword research, we're trying to figure out where's the money come from. Uh, yeah. I could care less in a lot of cases <laughs> about high volume keywords that have very low conversion intent. Um, and more so about, you know, valuable keywords. If you look at our own website, you'll see yeah. that there is a ton of long tail, very well converting, very specific keywords there yeah. versus a whole lot of, of big informational stuff. And so that's the approach that we take because at the end of the day, you know, SEO should have a return on what you're investing. And so as long as you have a good return, you can invest a lot. I mean, we have people that'll spend, you know, a, a little bit and, and on the other end, people that spend, you know, a million dollars or more on an SEO campaign. Uh-huh. And both of them are happy because we figured out how to make it worthwhile to do that. And that's, you know, all the, all the guru talk aside, that's, that's what keyword research really is, is how am I going to make more money from yeah. SEO? And that's where I'm going to start. And from yeah. there, you can always branch out because, Obviously, you know, informational keywords, you can do those like statistics, facts, things like that. Those will naturally Uh require links. So there's other things that you can do, but the starting point really is about finding where the value is and and capturing that. The commercial intent of the searcher. That's awesome. That's awesome. So how do you, how do you manage then client expectations with, with results? For instance, you know, you mentioned a keyword there that probably wasn't easy to rank for. and, And how do you, manage your team and your, your marketing budget and spend to get the work done for that client in a reasonable amount of time in which you as self as an agent make money and they also make money. Yeah. So the first thing that you have to be willing to accept and is to turn away clients and to tell clients, no, whenever what needs to happen and what they're willing to make happen, don't match. Okay. Right. That's, that's the big thing. A lot of agencies are afraid to say no to clients. And yeah. that's, you have to get past that because success comes from the right client, the right budget, the right strategy, all those things come together. That's when you okay. have success. And so the first thing that we want to do is set expectations, help them understand what it takes. Yeah. And so we do that by benchmarking certain things. Uh, just as a very simplified example, let's say that you want to rank for a keyword. 
Uh -huh. And everybody on the first page has a hundred referring domains to their page yeah. and your website has five. It's yeah. pretty likely that you're going to have to get close to that hundred mark before you show up. Now there's obviously um, examples where this isn't the case, exact mm -hmm. match or partial match domains. If the competitors have a lot of low quality links, no follow links, stuff like that. And so yeah. we do go through and we filter those out. But at the end of the day, if you figure out they have 55 good quality do follow referring domains and that's the average and you have five, yeah. we know we need to close that gap up. It may not take 50, but we're going to need to close it up. And yeah. so if you repeat that across multiple things, you start to see, okay, big picture wise, here's what we need to do on the link building side. If you yeah. take that same approach and you apply it to content, if you look at the top five or 10 for a keyword and they all have a 12,000 word guide and it's got chapters, it's got custom design graphics. They really yeah. went out of the way to make something awesome. And yeah. you have a 600 word blog post. <laughs> you're going to have to invest some time and some effort into your post to make it, to make it show up. Yeah. And, and then you can also do that with micro measurements as well. Think about things like anchor text. You know, what do you have to do there? Maybe you have a similar amount of links, but your anchor text profile is way off from everybody else ranking. Yeah. So yeah. you have to figure out mathematically, well, where, how do I close up the gap? You know, like if, yeah. if it's skewed heavily towards branded, I need to come the other direction. There's a certain number of links you're going to have to acquire in order to change those numbers in your favor. Yeah. And so that's how, that's how we set expectations is by looking at here's the specific differences between you and everybody who's accomplished what you hope to accomplish. And here's the plan that we need to follow to close that up, followed by a plan to, you know, excel past them once we do close up the gap. And so that helps with timeline, that helps with budget. And, and here's the great thing about this approach. If you know I have to do X, Y, and Z to be able to rank, to be successful. Yeah. And you know that it costs this many dollars to do that. Yeah. Then timeline becomes more of a matter of your comfortable budget than it does uh, like a retainer. So instead of saying like, well, you can pay us a retainer for 12 months and we'll do X, Y, and Z. We uh -huh. say, here's what needs to happen. Here's the cost to make all of this happen. Total cost how fast can you make this happen on your side, you know, within the budget you have. And that's one of the final checks as well. If it's going to take them three years to close up the gap, we know that by three years from now, the gap's going to be there still because the other sites are going to grow faster. And so yeah. you have to find somebody who is aware of the gap, has the budget to close it up, and they're willing to use it over a timeline that makes sense. And then you also figure in like, What's the typical growth of these other websites over the past 12 months? So you can add in a buffer for your own. Um, and so if you do all of those things, then that's how uh, that's how we set expectations is, is by kind of, you know, setting the stage, showing them here's what has to happen. Here's what's missing. And then we backfill. We've, and it's called uh, from my time in the military, it's called end state planning. So basically, in-state planning means that you figure out what does success look like? What's mission uh -huh. success look like? Or what's the, what, what is the goal to be accomplished? Yeah. And then from there, you work backwards. And so the only things that you work into your plan are things that help you accomplish the end goal. So that keeps you from wasting a lot of time and resources. It keeps you from going down rabbit holes. And it keeps you very focused on getting to the end goal. That's the exact yeah. same reason why we use a, a limited amount of tools, very specific things, because we have an end goal. Here's how we want to operate. And these are all the things that we need to operate the way we want to. And so we don't need any of the other stuff because it doesn't help us get to that very specific end goal. So that's the approach that we take. It works really well for us. Yeah. Uh, and it, oh, you know, it just cuts out a lot of, it cuts out waste. Yeah. So you basically take the time involved in knowing what's going to work for a client. And you obviously know your costs to achieve that result in regards mm -hmm. to labor and man hours and cost per link and content. Uh, I'm sure you've had that all figured out. And then you divide and then you just say, look, it's going to cost you 
let's just make up a number, $50,000. Mm-hmm. We can do that for you in one month. Do you want to spend 50 grand right now? Or we can do it for you uh, over a six month period. But there's mm-hmm. also a buffer in regards to how much these other websites are building on a monthly basis that you also have to take consideration to close up that gap. And that's how much that's going to cost for a buffer in order for you to close up that gap and, and, and get going. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it becomes a matter of not just a monthly retainer and we do this work, but this is what the end result's going to be depending on how fast or how, how quickly you want it. That makes, that makes so much sense to me. That's like a total game changer to yes. pitch SEO services that way. That just is brilliant. <laughs> Yeah. And so the reason it is, and it makes the most sense. And the only reason why people don't do it a lot of times is because yeah. it causes them to turn clients away. Yeah. If, you, if you give somebody the reality of the situation, they're going to be turned away. Whereas if you tell them I'll do X, Y, Z retainer per month and we'll get great uh-huh. results and you're very abstract about it yeah. then you can sign those people up. And that's where it comes back to what your agency model is. Okay. Long-term client retention, or you're trying to turn and burn, get them to sign up for one engagement and then replace them. Yeah. And so that's that's why not everybody does it, but with the with the approach that we're taking, that's why we do it that way because it makes the most sense. And oh, you know, it does. Obviously, clients stick around because by the time we get to the point we said, it's very similar to what we said would happen in terms of results. And so then when we talk about here's what we can do as phase two for additional growth, they have a lot more confidence than yeah. they would have. And you know what I'm saying? And so um, it's a good strategy. So then there's only certain clients that make sense with that business model, correct? Like for instance, right now, I'm just thinking a plumber would, a local plumber would not be an ideal client. No. And that's, we don't do many local clients at all. Yeah. Um, right. We do more national clients. Now the exception would be like personal injury attorneys. Um, uh-huh. But generally, those would be ones in the top 50 cities in the U.S., top 100 cities, like bigger, bigger locations, because then yeah. it, it yeah. does like the math checks out for them in terms of Absolutely. return versus investment, stuff like that. But um, we don't we don't really have any local service companies, anything like that. We would yeah. do more yeah. franchise, enterprise, medium mm-hmm. to larger mm-hmm. businesses uh, or people that have really big ticket items like injury attorneys and things like that. Did you have to grow into that niche being able to offer? Like, did you at one time, did you offer to local smaller clients and then grew into what you are today? Yep, we did. And so in the beginning, that very first client that I mentioned uh, paid me $400 per month. Oh, wow. And, And I was just laying out all the SEO stuff I could think of at the time to try to get his website to rank. And it ended up working out. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, he didn't pay me too much. And so I did a ton of work. And if you figured out what my hourly rate was at that point, it would have probably been pretty. Low. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and but you so got some results. It, yeah. And and we did. And that, that was really, for me, the most important part at that point is, you know, $400 per month wasn't going to do a lot for me. No. But having the successful campaign would do a lot for me. You know, and, so if someone's improve. just starting out offering SEO, they should bite the bite the bullet and and do some, if not low cost free work for, to prove that they can provide pro- provide the results. Yeah, and that makes it a lot easier going forward because if you can prove, here's what we've done. You yeah. know, it helps you go up that ladder faster. Yeah. Then you know, because if if you're talking to a larger client and you're asking for a much larger investment. But you you do can't show in any way that you've had any success. It's going to be wow, hard yeah. to sell. Oh, absolutely. You know? And so we did over the first few years. We went through different phases of figuring out what to offer. Do we target a particular industry? Do we mm-hmm. target a particular service? Do we mm-hmm. take everybody who wants to come on board? And so we went through that normal growth phase that you would kind of expect. And then over time we started to figure out, okay, here's the people we really like to work with the most. Yeah. And here's the, the industries we like, and here's the types of services we want to offer. And then you stop looking at people that don't fit into that criteria. And over time, you just make that transition, you know, to have the people you want. Yeah. 
So how effective do you think your military training has contributed to your effectiveness as a CEO of Stellar SEO? Like how has it contributed? Yeah. And so that's always a, I like the question. And a lot of people think like, well, do you wake up at 5 a.m. and make your bed every day and, and all the, you know, because <laughs> yeah. you see like the standard guru military person. I don't do any of those things. Um, but what, you know, I'd, I'd wake up at seven and I may or may not make my bed. So um, what really has been most helpful from that is, is the in-state planning approach where uh -huh. you just look at here's what success looks like here's the only things I need to get to what is a state of success and forget about everything else because the whole wow. SEO industry is just rife with shiny objects. And yeah. it's easy to go down a million rabbit trails, spend time and money. Uh, and, and I have over the years invested into stuff too, like, okay, they've, they've really piqued my interest. And so now I'm going to check this thing out. And then, uh -huh. You know, in the end, it doesn't necessarily get you where you're trying to go. And so you, you go back to doing what you need to do. Um, and so it happens to all this. But I think that really has probably been the most impactful thing is, is taking that kind of approach to it. Um, yeah. The second yeah. thing is, is confidence, right? If the mm -hmm. military does anything, it's a great, they give people a lot of confidence in their ability to do stuff that you may or may not think that you can do. Yeah. And so if you apply that to SEO, then you just approach it with a completely different mindset. Because if you say, I'm going to do something, then you're very, very confident that you're going to do it. And uh -huh. so you're fully committed to it. And, and it's easier to see it through and make it happen than if you're uncertain of yourself and you kind of have one foot out the door the whole time. You know, yeah. you're looking for what's a what's my excuse, what's my escape plan, what am I going to do instead of how am I going to figure out how to solve this problem, regardless of what obstacles I face? Those are the things I think they've really been the most helpful to me, um, you know, which is probably a little different than, than the typical answer. Um, you know, I, I'm self-disciplined to do stuff and, and I've been that way all these, it, it wasn't something that came from the military, stuff like that. Um, so I think really just, just, you know, keeping a narrowed focus on what you want to accomplish and being confident in your ability to deliver. Um, uh -huh. Those are, are probably the two biggest things that have impacted my ability um, over time to, to be successful with, with various things. That's awesome. So what qualities do you think are required in order to be effective in an SEO role in your position, in, in your opinion? Like what do you look for when you bring on a staff member or, or partner with someone? Yeah. So what we're looking for is, is people that are, are curious and they want to know why something works or how it works uh -huh. versus, you know, just learning, do A, B, and C, and then you'll probably get this result. Okay. So that's, that's one of the biggest thing is somebody who just wants to really get down into the nitty gritty of how everything works, why it works like it does. Because once you have that level of understanding or even that mindset, it makes it much mm -hmm. easier to pivot and to approach new problems, right? Yeah. If you're facing a brand new problem, there's not a ready-made solution. You're in trouble if you're counting on steps A, B, and C. Yeah. But yeah. if you're the kind of person who wants to understand, you know, how everything works together, you can use that to troubleshoot problems that you've never seen before. And I think Absolutely. that's probably the, one of the most important things. Um, you know, I, I obviously... I place a lot of value on people that are on time. They, you know, they meet deadlines. They do what they say they're going to do. Uh -huh. uh, and the reality is with the modern workforce, it's, it's harder and harder to find people that have those values. Um, yeah. So there is a growing, especially over the past two years with, with the COVID situation, work from home, there is a uh -huh. growing disconnect between you know, the workforce and things that are of value. And so you also have to be kind of flexible, you know, like they want to work more flexible hours and there's all these different things that, that is mm -hmm. an expectation now. Mm -hmm. um, and so that isn't, isn't always the best, but I think it's just the reality of how things are shifting. And so if you have those, those, you know, core fundamental skills or that mindset, then that's good. And then you have to be willing to kind of work with people um, that, that just have a completely different perception of what the work day is like yeah. and what being employed is like, because it is rapidly changing. 
Um, it and is, so, isn't it? you know, yeah. And it used to be the thing, like I would show up 15 minutes early to somewhere, you know, I would work until it got done. Like there's all these things that to me are very important values. And I think everybody should think of this way. And then the reality yeah. is the more and more people we interview, especially the, the younger people that we interview, it seems like, you know, it, it's one out of 10 people has that mindset and, and it's very much, um, you know, it, it's changed. And so I don't know if it's a change for the better, but it's just, that's the reality of what we're facing. And so you have to be adaptable to that and you have to figure out how to make everything work without, you know, relying on some of those things that, that just really don't happen as much anymore. So on that note, do you think it's better to to hire in-house or to outsource? So I think it's better to hire in-house because then you have quality control over everything. Uh-huh. Um, but we've been we've been doing a lot of testing and experimenting with this. And so things like riders. Um, yeah. For a long time, we had exclusively in-house riders only. So uh-huh. hourly in-house full-time riders. Yeah. And so as we noticed 2020, 2021, we went through that whole thing. Mm-hmm. We figured out, okay, there's now a ton of riders and they, they don't want a full-time job. They don't want an actual, you know, uh, structured position. They want to write X number of articles a week. And sometimes yeah. it's yeah. full-time, sometimes it's part-time, sometimes it's just a handful. And so, we've noticed that in being more flexible on that and in basically hiring, you know, independent contractors as writers, uh-huh. we're able to get some really good content from them, but just in a different way. Like maybe yeah. one writer, they do a great job and they only write a couple articles a week and they're happy with that amount of work. Yeah. And so we end up with way more writers to get the same output, but you know, it, it works like that. Now for other roles, um, you know, you can't do that. Like the the strategic, the planning, some of those things that are are kind of critical to the overall success of it. I I wouldn't be comfortable with people that are not full time on those because uh-huh. you don't know how much time or effort's going into it. But for roles like writers, um, you know, stuff like that, it, there has been um, benefits of looking for people who. Uh, don't necessarily want to be full-time employees, but they still do want to write because we have found some really good writers. We've gotten some really good content produced. Um, you know, and we just kind of shifted that. The other thing that we've intentionally done mm-hmm. is in 2020, we kind of hit a peak in terms of size of our agency, uh, customer size. And we got to a threshold where we said, you know what? it's starting to change from what we are into, you know, this is, is now a larger company that we're, we're operating differently. And yeah. so in 2020 and, and COVID it helped out because, you know, we had people requesting to pause and stuff during COVID. And so we use that as an opportunity to get rid of the clients that we'd, we'd kept on and they were happy with us, but they didn't really fit the core of what we wanted. Uh-huh. And so from 2020 Going into 2021, we've actually been downsizing our client base and being much more selective in who we work with. Yeah. So, you know, and that's and that's something we were selective even up until then. Right. Starting in about 2015, we started to get very selective in our clients. The first three years we were very open and that's where we're kind of growing into it. Um. So hit 2020 and we're saying, okay, we're going to start being even more selective now with, with who we're going to work with, what projects we're going to take on. Uh, you know, we're going to not renew clients that, that don't necessarily fit exactly what we want. Yeah. And, you know, with that, we also use the opportunity to purge some staff members that just were not performing to the level that, that you should be. Right. Uh And so I've been extremely happy with that change that we've taken uh, yeah. because, you know, we have both a better pool of, of employees and, and uh, writers that are independent contractors. And of course we have a, you know, kind of a handpicked pool of clients left. And so we got rid of kind of the, some of the fluff around the edges that, that was starting to accrue. And so yeah. that's something that we're going to be extremely mindful of going forward is, you know, don't increase quantity, increase quality. And so uh-huh. we're going to kind of cap staff size and we're going to stack uh, cap 
um, clients. And we're going to make sure that, you know, instead of just growing endlessly, we're going to replace with, with a client of better quality or that's a better project for us, a better fit. Um, yeah. and that's, that's kind of, you know, it's, it was spurred by a few things, but one of which was, you know, just how the workforce has evolved and changed. Uh, uh -huh. And, you know, we just said like, we, we don't want to go down that route because there's so many agencies that just scale exponentially and our quality goes out the window and, yeah. you know, it's, it's a ticking time bomb or they sell it and somebody else takes over and, and continues yeah. it, but we just didn't want to go that way. So uh -huh. uh, all those things kind of came together. 2020 made it kind of a perfect storm where we said, okay, let's really refocus and let's be very intentional about both sides. Who yeah. We're going to let work for us, what clients we're going to let work with us. And, and that's something that, um, you know, I, I think it's been a, a profound change and it's really one of the bigger changes we've made since, you know, 2015, when we started being very selective in the first place with the clients we would take on. And so I guess it's, it's really just another phase of growth, but not yeah. in the sense of traditionally where you think I'm going to, you know, continue to scale something exponentially. We grew in a, in a different direction of sorts. You talked about a couple of things, like for instance, I guess you had to get to a certain level of success though, before you could start actually turning clients away. Yeah, you do. And, and so that's something that I've always kind of been baffled by as you see, uh, you know, in Facebook groups, training program, there's all these quote unquote SEO agencies yeah. and, but they really never, they, they hit like six figures maybe. Yeah. And they never really go any further than that. Yeah. And so I, I can't really figure out like how that happens to them because uh -huh. within, you know, we went from zero to six figures, probably within 24 months of starting. Yeah. And so then from, you know, hitting the six figure mark to the seven figure mark only took, you know, a couple more years and, and then there we were. Yeah. And so I'm shocked by, and we've had people even interview for us, you know, who had their own SEO agency. Uh -huh. uh, quote unquote. And, and, you know, they, the agency made $80,000 a year or something. Yeah. I, I'm really yeah. baffled by, by how there's so many agencies that don't get past that point. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I guess we got lucky or our approach, people liked it, but we, we excelled past those kind of pain points pretty quickly. Yeah. And so we were able to start being more selective sooner than later but I definitely do see how agencies that are stuck, like in the low six figures that you, I don't, you can't really be selective at that point. No. I don't. And then the other thing is there's all of this advice where people say, if you can't grow, you have to niche down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, when yeah you're stuck, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so I believe that that works for people. And I think it's a great approach, but if you're unable to get past a certain point by covering everybody, I don't know that that's the magic ticket. Like yeah. if you've yeah. taken on anybody you can get as a client and your agency makes a hundred thousand dollars a year, and now you decide I'm only going to take on one third of this group, you're not going to skyrocket your sales in most cases. That's why I think a no. lot of people fell. Now there yeah. are success stories, but heck there's, there's SEO uh -huh. agencies that cover <laughs> yeah. every industry that are just as successful. Yeah. Right. And so they use that as a basis for it. So, you know, so they, early they on, niche out in they vertical, different get. verticals. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was going to say early on. You have to take what you can get. And then as you have more and more success, you're able to be more selective. Um, but that's like to other agencies and stuff. I just say you got to stop listening to all this guru advice. And yeah. it's just there's so much nonsense in it. Yeah. Like if you can't sell anything to anybody, trying to sell anything to less people isn't going to make you more money because you can't sell anything. That's the problem. Yeah. You know, yeah. And so um, uh, I think we got lost from the original question, but it, it no, it's okay. Been, it uh, still is very interesting though. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. And so over time, <laughs> I mean, the original question where, yeah, yeah. the original question were what other roles, but what, what qualities does the person have in a role, but it doesn't matter because the, the follow-up of it and your thought process is, is just very interesting. So that's fine that we strayed from the original question. Uh, yeah. It all makes sense. <laughs> yep. So yeah. 
Do you think that, like, for instance, you, you mentioned in, uh, you know, you had writers in house. And I mean, uh, me personally, I find it surprising because I know there's so many uh, websites out there where you can get content written, mm-hmm. uh, which is fine, though. It's interesting to hear your approach about that. But, and for the, in, for the in house side of things, like the strategy side of things, I can see, I can see how you would want to keep that in house. Do you think there's a room for agencies? Like, do you do any sort of uh, outsourcing? Because that's the whole thing nowadays, especially with COVID. Everybody talking about outsource, outsource, outsource. I mean, from what I understand about, and I could be wrong, Toyota as a company, they they outsource everything <laughs> uh, in the manufacturing of their vehicles. Um, for instance, I think BMW even makes one of their models. Um, do you think that there's a place for that in agencies, in your agency? Or, 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 or what are your thoughts on that? So I think outsourcing can be... I think it can be done really well. Yeah. I think where, where it breaks down for most people is yeah. they try to outsource something that they don't quite understand. Oh, okay. And so they don't know if they're getting what they should be getting on the other side of that. Like we have tested yeah. a lot of content writing services, like specifically okay. services to see what would come out on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. And what we figured out is if we hire writers directly, the cost of the content is lower and the quality Uh is generally better because the content agency is trying to mark up the lowest cost writer they can to pad their profit margins because that's their only source of profit. And so if you don't know what kind of content you should expect at what price, then you can overpay and, and be Get getting content, content, it's pretty low tier. Yeah. And same thing with link building. We do some white label link building for other people. And, uh-huh. and so, you know, our, our cost on that is a little higher than they probably pay for other services that do the same thing. Yeah. But yeah. if they know what they're looking for, then they'll understand why it makes sense to pay us more for the links that they're getting. Yeah. And so I think outsourcing can be extremely effective. And I think it can work really well in a lot of cases, so long as you understand what should be happening on the other side of it. Because if you don't, you really don't know what quality you're getting. And you can run into scenarios where you're just buying something with the sole purpose of the other companies marked it up as much as they can, yeah. but bringing the quality as low as they can. And yeah. so I don't think the problem is with outsourcing itself or okay. having strategic partners, it's an understanding, ex, you know, and having realistic expectations of quality, um, deliverables, all those things. If you know those things, you could definitely outsource it and be successful. And so yeah. just like with everything else, a lack of knowledge, I think is what makes it break there down you go. more so than, than the process itself. Because for hundreds of years, major corporations have been outsourcing things you know, and, and even in earlier pre-business times, you can look at where there's been, uh, you know, outsourcing of sorts where all of one type of item comes from somebody of a particular skill set. Yeah. Know, and it goes into production of something else. And so the, the process itself, there's nothing wrong with it as uh-huh. long as you understand what you're getting into. And yeah, there's so many agencies like new agencies pop up all the time. And with varying levels of experience. And so a lot of times they don't even know enough about SEO to know whether or not they're doing something that's, that's harmful, helpful. That's effective. Yeah. That's, that's where (laughs) Uh, it's amazing. Uh, What do you think is the future of SEO? So I think that um, I think quality is going to have to continue to go up Mm -hmm. and you know, and what this comes back to what Google says and what Google does you can still find articles ranking that are are nonsense more or less. And they're yeah. not ranking yeah. very well written stuff because Google's not to the point where they say they are, mm-hmm. um, but they'd like to be. And yeah. so, yeah. you know, that's, I think quality will be ever more important in the future because there's going to be more competition, the same amount of spots or fewer, because if mm-hmm. you think back even several years ago, there used to be more spots in the map pack rankings there were less featured snippets and things on the, on the first page. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be less real estate with more competition. And so, you know, it's going to also need to evolve Mm -hmm. to be more, more realistic marketing. 
um, in a sense, SEO, there's still some things you can do kind of quick wins or hacks or, or things, but it's shifting more and more, especially with e-commerce, think e-commerce, where bigger companies are starting to win out more and more. And so smaller companies, uh, you know, competing on that scale, they're not having as much success. And that's very much like what you saw with other marketing channels of the past there are certain companies that be, began to dominate. And so I think that in certain industries and verticals, you are going to see the door close on a, on companies that fall below a certain size or threshold. And that's where local SEO, for mm-hmm. those companies, mm-hmm. local SEO is going to be extremely important. Whereas mm-hmm. right now they still might be relying on, on organic rankings, um, you know, but they're going to have to take a much more localized strategy and I think you're going to see some more dominance by by bigger brands, bigger companies, um, especially in in the eat, which I have my own yeah. opinion about that whole thing. But if yeah. you're in one of those fields, um, then it makes a ton of sense why you would want to have actually known credible entities, for example, yeah. giving medical advice. Yeah. So yeah. if they can figure out a way to skew it in favor of that, it really makes a lot of sense and it would be safer for people who are searching for like drug interactions and stuff like that, if it was credible sources. And so I think if they can figure out how to do that in certain industries, they definitely will push in favor of those, but there's still going to be a big part of, of as far as industries and niches and stuff where SEO is still wide open and it's going to become a matter of quality because they're already, you know, saying it used to be right longer and longer and longer content. That's kind of the thing, right? Quality yeah. more or less equates to you have more words on the page. Yeah. And yeah. now they're finally starting to surface some results that are more concise over yeah. the longer yeah. counterparts. And so as that continues, uh, well, think about this. If you can't just write a longer article to outrank somebody, then it has to be a different signal that they're using to figure out who to rank the best. Right. Yeah. At first, that's how you got into this whole content length battle. They're like, oh, this one's much longer. It's got to be better. Yeah. It's going to go back to links. Links are going to be more important than they are right now. And they're pretty darn important right now. But the importance of them is going to continue to go up because there's going to have to be something that serves as the tiebreaker. And so that's where the quality of links is also going to be coming very important. Right. It's not a matter of you have 100 links and everybody else has 50. Yeah. You better have some heavy hitter links in there as well, because they're going to have to figure out how to better, better weight the impact that a link has based on its quality, how difficult it is to earn that link, how many mm-hmm. people have mm-hmm. it. They've got to have stuff going in the background already to look at this stuff from some of the previous updates and changes they've made. Mm-hmm. But I think you're going to see that get supercharged as content becomes you know, it's on more, I don't want to say content will be less good, but it'll be more on, on a level playing field. You can't just write a 10 times longer guide and expect it to perform much better. Yeah. Um, Because that's, that's kind of the opposite of where they're going. So uh, I guess there's two questions I have then. What do you think makes up a high quality backlink? There's a lot of metrics that, that people use, right? Domain authority, domain rating, they're all kind of made up. Yeah, uh, Google yeah. looks at and Google has their own, you know, page yeah. rank. And, and so it's unfortunately they don't publish it anymore in the toolbar. But, no. um, you know, actual authority to a page is is very important, as is relevancy. Relevancy. Right. And so a quality backlink has to have both authority. We call it the art of link building authority, relevancy and trust. Yeah. But. With authority, we don't mean like domain authority, domain rating. We mean like, is this website actually an authoritative source on a topic? Like uh, if, you, yeah. if you're going to get a link to an article about a foot problem, who's an authority on the topic? A doctor, a podiatrist? Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's an authority source of a link yeah. because he should know what he's talking about. That's a specialty, right? And, and same thing with, with relevancy and trust. If he's a foot doctor... And, you know, he's linking to your, and it could be other things as well. Like maybe it's shoes that have some kind of corrective benefit. And so you have foot doctors linking to your um, pages about shoes, then that's going to be a very authoritative and relevant and trustworthy source of information on that. 
And so I think that's, that's what they're going to look at is how did those things deliver? And to some extent they already do because you can find a lot of cases where a website will have poor metrics, low domain rating, low domain authority, yeah. but they have extremely good rankings. And so if yeah. you look into it more, you'll see that most of their links just come from very relevant and very, um, you know, trustworthy websites on a topic. And it, and it may not be authority websites because, you know, the old thing was, well, let me go out and I'll buy up links on Forbes and Inc. and, yeah. and any sites yeah. I can get from the list. Right. And so those don't necessarily benefit you as much as if you go out and you get links from super relevant websites that maybe have half the authority of of those major sites because the relevancy part's huge. So you, when you look at links, people tend to focus on on little things. You know, you know, how did you get the link? Does yeah. quality yeah. link mean it's paid or does it mean if you pay for a link, it can never be quality? Yeah. But what you're really looking at with all this is why in the world would I care if website A is vouching for website B? And if I yeah. don't care at all what website A has to say about website B, the value of that link's not going to be as good. Uh -huh. And so today, Google's capabilities still allow you to manipulate that and, and rank and gain advantage from that. But yeah. if we're looking into the future still, as they, yeah. as they get better and better, you're just going to have to be more scrutinizing in what exactly would be a, a worthwhile site to vouch for you. And yeah. that's, that's what makes a quality backlink. And so it's a sliding scale. Right okay. now, if you have a medical website and you get health websites to link to you and they have decent metrics and they have organic traffic and rankings, that yeah. link's still helpful. Yeah. You know, and it might get less helpful in the future, depending on those criteria that it does or doesn't meet. Okay. And so that's how it'll kind of evolve. So I think it's very much a sliding scale where the same kind of things are going to be important now and in the future of what makes a quality link. Yeah. But just yeah. the barrier to entry on that sliding scale is going to go up. Yeah, absolutely. So do and you think... To that extent, it already has. I mean, obviously. Yeah. Well. So you think SEO is going to get harder? I think so. I, I don't know. So I don't necessarily know if, if harder would be the word. I think you're going to see okay. more and more agencies Complex. that... that uh, I think there's going to be a higher failure rate amongst SEO agencies. Okay because they're not able to successfully deliver what needs to be done. I think yeah. knowing what needs to be done will be easier to understand, but actually delivering it will be harder. Yeah. Wow. Hey, so do, do you think that people should buy backlinks still? So uh, we've worked with campaigns that do buy backlinks and ones who yeah. are, are adamantly against it. Okay. And we've had a ton of success both ways. And, okay. and I can tell you there are enterprise level companies that buy up backlinks as, as fast as possible. Okay. You know, and, the, and they still do. And it's a big part of link building right now is link exchanges, paid links, yeah. you know, editorial fees, give it any name you want to, but there's something yeah. recent wills to get link placements yeah. in a lot of cases. And so Absolutely. I think it's more about risk management than it is about, you know, yes or no. Like if yeah. you're adamantly against buying links, then that's fine. We can build links for you without you paying for them. Uh, yeah. There's ways to do that. But, yeah. you know, on the other hand, if you want to buy links, you can also do that pretty safely by managing risk. And so yeah. what you're looking for is, is there a huge footprint? Do they have yeah. a right for us in the menu? And you click on it and it says, send $50 to this PayPal account and we'll publish your article. That seems like <laughs> it'd be pretty easy for Google to pick up on. Right? Yeah. But if you have to reach out to a site, go back and forth with them a few times, start a conversation with somebody, and eventually you strike an agreement to, uh, you know, pay them to be able to publish select articles on their website. Yeah. As yeah. long as there's no signals on the website itself, <clears throat> it's really hard to pick that up algorithmically. Yeah. You know? So Absolutely. that's where, you know, I, I think, in my personal opinion is that you can buy backlinks extremely successfully right now. And a lot of people do where people get in trouble is they get sloppy with it. They'll load up a thousand websites into uh, email. They'll send uh -huh. it out. And then as soon as somebody replies to that very first email with a price, they publish. 
yeah. you know, the link, right? Those are easy to find and those end up on more people's lists. But if you're a little more scrutinizing with it, you pick better sites, you look at what kind of stuff they're linking to, you look at what kind of content they're publishing, you look at relevancy. If you take all these things into consideration and you minimize the risk as much as you can, you yeah. absolutely yeah. can still buy links and you can do it very successfully. Um, and, and we have even within the past 12 months have yeah. taken on some clients that in the past bought links. Uh -huh. They hired another company. That company said, Oh, paid links are the devil. You got to get rid of them. They yeah. disavowed all these links. The client's oh, traffic yeah. plummeted even worse than it was. Yeah. They hired us. We undisavowed those links, bought some more links and boom, traffic went up, you know, Four thousand. That's wow. And that's that other company taking a boilerplate, boilerplate, boilerplate regurgitating approach mm -hmm. to yep. SEO. Whereas yep. we're looking at what actually works in that specific instance. Mm -hmm. And and wow. it all comes back to this: looking at the particular instance, like you mentioned, and figuring out what you can and can't do in that case to be successful, because. Wow. There are websites, and that's the other side people say is, well, isn't that an increased risk? Well, guess what? In 2012, websites that had followed best practices up into that point all got demolished because yeah. the best practices changed. So just Absolutely. because you didn't buy links, and there have been people, if you look at, at any of kind of the chatter after a Google update, there's always yeah. people who say, I never paid for any links. I never did this, but my website still lost traffic. Yeah. Well, your website was collateral damage. There's a website who did all the things they weren't supposed to. They did it smartly and their traffic doubled during yeah. that same update. So wow. it's very much a matter of, of, you know, you just have to know, you have to know how to approach stuff and you have to, you have to use reasoning like three years ago or so, maybe longer, I wrote an article and pretty much said scholarship link building is dead. Uh -huh. I, I don't think it's a good tactic because, and I listed X, Y, and Z, here's why. Yeah. And so lo and behold, three years later, whatever it is, Google cites a scholarship page in one of their uh, manual link penalties and search engine journal wrote an article about it. You so they totally confirmed, that, they that confirmed what you said is true. Exactly. And, wow. and you could completely see that coming years ago. Like I remember in the article I wrote, like one of the scholarship pages I linked to they had like best diet pill scholarship, best mattresses for overweight people scholarship. Like, oh my goodness, ridiculous. Oh, that's ridiculous. Ridiculous links on the page. It's like, yeah, you can't see the Makes writing no on sense. the wall here. This is going to yeah. be bad news for you. And yeah. that's, it just comes back to boilerplate, I guess. I'm, I'm just, sometimes I'm baffled by the things that go on and how long they continue. Um, yeah. But a lot of times I feel like you can see the writing on the wall. Yeah. Way in advance. Yeah. So how do you stay current then? You yourself as a company, as an SEO with the changes, the algorithm changes, the Google changes, you know, in the industry. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of, so with the smaller stuff, it, it really comes back to that, you know, analyzing a particular search result and seeing what's different. Yeah. And then we even, we'll keep track. Like if we have a client in a particular space, we'll say, yeah. okay, okay, in January, these 10 websites ranked in February, it was these 10 in March. It's, oh, six of them are different now in March. What's different between the four that dropped off and the ones that came up. Yeah. So that helps you figure out kind of those micro changes is what, what really happened, what changed, what's different. But on the bigger scale of it, what you have to also be on the lookout for is, is what is being overdone in a okay. particular case. Because once something starts to be overdone, mm -hmm. the likelihood of it getting on Google's radar goes up. Like if you yeah. remember guest posting broad scale, they had all those services where you could sign up and basically swap guest posting opportunities with yeah. people. And then eventually it blew up because it got really big. Everybody knew about it. Yes. You know, if you think uh, like Huffington Post, everybody was buying links on that website and yeah. it got to be such a known problem that they've made them all no follow. Yeah. Right. Because everybody was doing it right yeah. now. Yeah. Something that I think will be one of the next things that becomes problematic is people have these public databases of websites that you can buy links from. Okay. 
Because if you look at it, it's really easy to amass a huge collection of these websites yeah, and yeah. figure out what they all have in common. And I know for sure there's people who go around just to collect these up and report them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Like there's uh, Google employees, you mean, but also other SEOs who are like on the white hat crusade. Okay. Yeah. They, they go around and do it. I, I can't remember <laughs> if it was like in the SEO signals lab, Facebook group, or uh, mm-hmm. there's one that Brian Dean has, but somebody was on there talking specifically about doing that, reporting yeah. these sites, these paid sites. And so, you know, it's, I don't think it's the people individually doing it, but if you look at what happened in the past, private blog network, SAPE links, yeah. all these yeah. things that happened in the past, and they eventually got in trouble. It was something that you could feed a whole bunch of data into something, find patterns between them and then then punish it. And reverse engineer it and punish it. Exactly. And so the, the, the published list of sites, that one seems like it's going to be fairly easy for them to figure something out with, because there's no telling between people reporting links and disavow files and, you know, all the public databases that you can scrape. It, yeah. it seems like that's going to be another one that, that gets into trouble. Um, and that's why, you know, if you're going to buy links, it comes back to risk management, do your own outreach and find, find sites. There'll be okay. some sites that are on public list that are good sites, right? Because yeah. somebody found it and they published it, but there's other sites where I can open somebody's backlink profile and say 500 of these sites. I know that you bought them and I know where you bought them because I yeah. can pull up the list right now. And so, and if I can that do data. that, Google can do that because they're a lot smarter than me and they've got a lot more people and resources. So yeah. you just have to kind of think big picture, what's going to leave a giant footprint that can be problematic. And so that's something that we always look at um, as well. And, and there's been several instances of that, but I think that these paid site lists that are publicly available are going to be one of the next things because that's what ultimately took down the, the public blog networks and all those kind of things. Yeah. Do you think there's still a place for building your own private blog networks that are naturalized, so to speak? I think you can do it and get away with it if you build them like actual websites. So if you think about big brands, they'll yeah. have 15, 20 websites or more, and they'll interlink those websites to each other. Yeah. Right, but they're all like good, legitimate websites. But in essence, yeah. that's kind of a, a network that they have where they're linking to each other and powering up their new sites. Yeah. So, you know, I think that if you do it with quality and, and each one of those sites in your network does have a real purpose, yeah, then you can do it and you can benefit from it. But then it comes back to weighing the, the cost versus the reward on that. Yeah. So if you do link building and you do it only for a particular industry and you uh-huh. want to set up and run a hundred really good blogs on plumbing yeah, and your all your clients are plumbers, you're probably going to get your money back on those sites because you're going to have a bunch of people that you can link to from them. Yeah. But, you know, if you do a ton of different industries, you could spend, you know, thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars a year on site maintenance for yeah. a one particular website. Whereas if you spent the same money or, or probably 75% less, you could go and get a link from a, an actual website yeah, and it's going to carry more value. So, it, you know, it kind of, wow. you have to look at like, <laughs> what's the return on my time and effort? You know, yeah. if, if I'm going to spend $2,500, do I want to set up a little PBN with an expired domain or, yeah. you know, do I want to go and try to find a couple of really juicy links from sites that have been growing steadily for years and yeah. see if I can, can work out a, a private Deal. arrangement with them to get something published. Wow. That's amazing. It just depends. Yeah. So it depends on the situation and the cost versus reward. Of return on investment of time and money in mm-hmm. regards to doing that. Yeah. Um, so what is, I, I just have a couple more questions. I, I know we I could talk to you. Uh, there's, I have, there's the question list of questions. I, I we're not even going to get through them all, but it's just, you, it's been so fascinating to talk to you and hear you t- <laughs> talk about things with such authority because you can tell you, you have a lot of experience. So um, what are your favorite SEO resources then besides tools? Like for, reading on SEO, I guess. 
Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of good ones. I like, so I like the people that publish tests and case studies. So on Facebook, there's a group called SEO signals lab. Yeah. Uh, it's been I covered remember. a few different places, but, but they talk about a lot of pretty good and interesting stuff there in the threads. So yeah. that's a good one. Okay. Um, Matt Diggity. He Matt has, Diggity, yeah. uh, yeah. So he's got a couple of different companies, but his blog, um, and he, he publishes actual, you know, studies, things like that, which are always very interesting to read because there's good information behind those. Um, yeah. that's a good one. I, I personally am a fan of Brian Dean. Uh, oh, yeah. Linko. Now him and yeah. Neil Patel, both, they sometimes tend to get a little bit on like the fictionalized version of reality with how stuff works. Yeah. But if you look at the underlying information and messaging and approaches, there's mm-hmm. a lot of value in the stuff that he has. And, and that's the Brian Dean courses are actually some of the ones that we have purchased. Um, yeah. You know, and, and that's the, the blueprint training from Ryan Stewart. Um, it's pretty solid. It, it kind of walks you through a whole lot of different stuff. Um, but, but they have some really, really cool stuff in there. They do with automation on audits and things like that. Yeah. So yeah. that's where I kind of like to look at that. And, you know, so basically groups or, or masterminds, things like that, those yeah. are good yeah. places because you're going to get some information and stuff that you might not otherwise see. Mm-hmm. And, and so that works out. Um, what you have to be wary of is if it's something that is broadcast extremely mainstream, yeah. um, yeah. then it, you know, if it's something that could be viewed by Google as manipulative, okay, then it kind of starts a countdown until it doesn't work anymore. Okay. And so sometimes the best place to find information is actually by looking at, at websites and places where it's not going to be quite as, uh, quite as well known or quite as popular. So there are there private membership mastermind SEO communities that you besides SEO signals that you can or would like to share? If not, I'm just curious. That's all. Yeah. So there, there's some good ones. That that group's a good one. But sometimes the the groups that come along with training those are yeah. those are really good groups because um, and and that's why it's not a specific one. It's whichever okay. training because there's there's other good trainings that you may or may not mesh with the way that you think and approach things. Okay. So a lot of times though, those are actually pretty good. Like there's a Facebook group that goes with the stuff from Brian Dean. Yeah. Um, And so what happened is people went through the training, they've tried different things. They've brought up issues they've ran into. They've discussed Mm -hmm. ways to modify it, things like that. And so sometimes the value isn't so much that you found this super exclusive group that nobody else knows about. Is okay. that you found a group with a whole lot of like-minded people who are trying to uh, do something very similar. Okay. And so you then start to pull all of that knowledge together. Yeah. And then it then it has real benefit. And so that's been, you know, some of the best ones um, that I've seen is is actually where you have that good back and forth between the members versus the kind where it's just a trainer and the majority of the content is coming from the person teaching. There are yeah. a lot like that, but a lot of times those are really just there. It's it's more or less sales information in disguise a lot of times. Yeah. And so you have to be a little skeptical of, of how they're trying to direct you. Yeah. Um, because it may or may not make a ton of sense. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I have yeah. like 20, 20 other questions I could ask, but uh, I think I'll maybe leave it for part two if we can ever connect again. But I want to respect your time. Uh, I know we've gone over a little bit, but uh, I just have five uh, rapid fire follow-up questions for you. Uh, what is your favorite movie? Uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Wolf of Wall Street. Right on. Yeah, that's an awesome movie. Uh, are you a, a, a early bird or a night owl? Early bird. Early bird. Um, salty or sweet? Ah, well, that's a tough one. Maybe sweet. Okay. What is your favorite meal of the day? Uh, breakfast, lunch, or, or dinner? Uh, probably dinner. Breakfast is is a little early sometimes. Don't yeah. want to interfere with it. Maybe lunch. I don't know if I... I'm merely maybe split between lunch and dinner, I guess. Okay. And um, do you learn by watching or... Do you learn by watching or doing? Uh, doing. Yeah. I think most people are the same. Travis, if uh, people want to find out more about you, where would they go? 
Yeah, just go to stellarseo.com. There's a ton of great resources on there. Uh, check out the blog. There's a couple guides. Uh, that, that's yeah. the best place to do it. We're not we're not extremely active on social media. Oh, okay. But the website's a, a great place to go, and and lot, there's a lot of good and new information coming out on there. Content, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, on LinkedIn, are you on there? We are on LinkedIn and Twitter. We, we okay. don't do too much with those. We we haven't too really much. had a, a big need to do it. Okay. But. Yeah, you're busy enough with client work. Well, Travis, thank you very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you having you here and you sharing uh, what you shared today. It's been totally awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. No problem. You have a great day. You too.